The central event of the 20th century is the overthrow of matter. This famous quote from George Gilder sets the stage for our exploration today into his groundbreaking ideas on the information theory of economics. For those unfamiliar, George Gilder is an American investor, writer, economist, and tech guru. Over his decades-spanning career, he has authored several influential books that have shaped economic policy and guided the evolution of technology and capitalism. Critics have dubbed him the mind of the new machine world and the king of the counterculture for capitalism. His seminal works include Wealth and Poverty, Life After Television, Telecosm, The Israel Test, and most recently, the 2018 release Life After Google, which predicted the rise of blockchain technology. However, today, we will be delving into Gilder's magnum opus, Life After Capitalism, published in 2022. In this monumental book, Gilder puts forth a revolutionary new framework for understanding economics through the lens of information theory. This podcast aims to unpack the core tenets of Gilder's information theory of economics and how it challenges long-held beliefs in traditional economic thought. We will explore concepts like money as time, wealth as knowledge, information as surprise, and economic growth being driven by learning. Buckle up as we embark on dissecting ideas that may just redefine how you view wealth, value, and the very nature of capitalism itself. Chapter 1. Money is Time One of the inspirations behind Gilder's time price theory was the work of William Nordhaus, a Yale economist and Nobel laureate. In the early 1990s, Nordhaus proposed a novel approach to quantifying economic growth, looking at it in terms of the time costs of light. To illustrate, Nordhaus calculated that producing 150 million lumen hours of light per year, which a 100 watt light bulb could provide by burning for three hours every night, would have required burning over 17,000 candles continuously in the year 1800. For an average worker then, earning the equivalent of just a few dollars per day, the labor time required to afford those candles amounted to nearly 1,000 hours annually. Fast forward to 1992, and that same quantity of light could be generated with just 22 degrees of electricity from a light bulb. At the typical wages, this meant the time cost had plummeted to merely 10 minutes of labor per year. This lighting example highlights how technological advancement has enabled humans to obtain the same value or utility from far less labor time over the decades. In 1800, that much light came at a staggering 6,000 times higher, time cost compared to 1992 levels. As Gilder posits, looking solely at monetary prices obscures the very essence of economic progress, the increasing efficacy with which we can transform human effort and time into value and resources that improve our lives. Nominal pricing fails to account for the resources and production methods available in each era. Inspired by Nordhaus work, economists Gail Pooley and Marion Tupi extended the time pricing concept with a simple formula. Time price, nominal price, nominal wage rate. This calculates the labor time embodied in any goods or service, providing a gauge of its real affordability across different periods and income levels. Let's consider that quintessential American tradition, the Thanksgiving dinner. In 1986, George spent around $30 to feed his family for their Thanksgiving feast. Fast forward to 2021, and his daughter spent $51 on the same meal. By nominal pricing alone, it would appear the cost of this holiday indulgence had risen by 70% over those 35 years. However, the agricultural experts at the American Farm Bureau dispute this, claiming after adjusting for inflation, the real cost of a Thanksgiving dinner has remained essentially flat. Yet George begs to differ. He points out that while the dollar amounts have increased, 
The time cost for him to afford that $30 meal back in 1986 was equivalent to one fortieth of his annual income. Whereas for his daughter in 2021, the 51 bill amounted to less than one one hundredth of her yearly earnings. You see, by looking through the lens of time price, what was once over an hour's wages for George in the 80s had become a mere 23 minutes worth of his daughter's labour a few decades later. The financial outlay increased, but the time cost, the embodied human effort required, had drastically diminished. This time, price perspective allows Gilder to challenge the prevalent Malthusian view that perpetual economic growth is unsustainable as human population inevitably outstrips limited natural resources. The traditional economic axiom states that more people means more resource consumption, leaving less for each individual. However, time price data tells a different story. Between 1980 and 2020, the global population grew by 75%. And yet, the time price of the 50 most vital commodities fell by 75% over that same period. In other words, despite a vastly larger population, each person could afford far more resources and at lower time costs than their predecessors a few decades prior. How is that possible if we assume resources are strictly finite? The answer, according to Gilder, is that human knowledge and creativity are the ultimate resources enabling this remarkable increase in material abundance amid population growth. Take the span from 1980 to 2020 again. Global population up 75% but an average worker's labour time could purchase 300% more goods and services by the end of that period compared to the start. Far from a doom spiral of depleting resources, human ingenuity has consistently expanded the resource pie, making more from less in terms of time expenditure. This reveals a critical flaw in conventional economic thought. It views humans as mere consumers, failing to account for our capabilities as creators and problem solvers. Chapter 2. Wealth is Knowledge The central event of the 20th century is the overthrow of matter. This famous quote from George Gilder encapsulates his core thesis that the true source of wealth lies not in the physical resources we consume, but in the knowledge and information we create and exchange. Traditional economics operates under what Gilder calls the materialist superstition, the belief that wealth resides in the possession of scarce physical resources like land, precious metals and oil reserves. This materialist view holds that all wealth, at its most fundamental level, simply constitutes different arrangements of atoms and molecules. Following this logic, the wealth possessed by some inevitably denies it to others, making economic prosperity a zero-sum game of acquiring and defending finite resources. It's no wonder conventional thought has bred sayings like the rich get richer while the poor get poorer, and fears that population growth will inevitably lead to resource depletion. However, Gilder contends this materialist superstition is fatally flawed, because it only sees one side of the human condition, the consumer. It fails to account for the other reality, that of the human as creator, innovator and problem solver. Just as the primitive caveman technically possessed more natural resources per capita than modern humans, yet lived a poverty-stricken existence, physical resources alone do not dictate wealth. It is human ingenuity, knowledge and creativity applied to those resources that unlocks their potential value. To illustrate his wealth as knowledge perspective, Gilder provides some insightful examples. When you dine out, the bulk of what you pay for is not the material ingredients, but rather the culinary knowledge and skills of the chef and staff in transforming those basic components into a refined dining experience. Similarly for automobiles, 
while a wrecked high-end vehicle may retain the same material composition as before the accident, it has been rendered virtually valueless because the crucial knowledge that went into its design and manufacture has been lost. Gilder further argues that even extractive industries like oil are really just embodiments of human knowledge about locating, drilling and refining those resources into valuable products and services. The atoms comprising crude oil are ubiquitous, but it's our scientific mastery that allows us to utilize it as an energy source. Perhaps no industry better exemplifies the primacy of knowledge over physical resources than the silicon economy of semiconductors and computing. As Gordon Moore, the co-founder of Intel and progenitor of Moore's Law, once quipped, the raw materials for a microchip, silicon, oxygen and aluminum, are among the most abundant elements in the Earth's crust. They are essentially dirt, very inexpensive. The true value in the silicon economy does not come from the mere atoms comprising the chips, but rather the accumulated knowledge allowing us to precisely arrange them into functional integrated circuits, processors, memory and all manner of powerful computing devices. It is an industry built entirely on human ingenuity and learning. Stemming from this wealth as knowledge view, Gilder aligns with the economist Thomas Sowell's perspective that economic transactions are fundamentally an exchange of knowledge. Think about it. How did the money in your wallet get there? You earned it by applying certain knowledge and skills through your work and labor. And what do you trade that money for? The embodied knowledge of others, whether restaurant chefs, automotive engineers, energy scientists, software developers, or any other product or service provider. At every level, from the individual up to corporations and nation states, economic transactions represent the trading of differentiated knowledge across parties. Your personal skill set and insights get exchanged for those possessed by others through the intermediary of money. This is a radical departure from the conventional economic notion of merely exchanging material resources based on relative supply and demand. Gilder posits that all trade, at its core, is an intricate dance of knowledge sharing among the members of the human species. So, in summary, the wealth we obsess over and endlessly pursue is not a accumulated hoard of material riches. True wealth flows from the boundless fount of human intellect, our capacity to create valuable knowledge that elevates our lives and unlocks the potential within the physical world around us. Wealth is knowledge. This brings us to the next foundational pillar of Gilder's information theory of economics. The paradoxical notion that information, the progenitor of all knowledge and wealth, is fundamentally rooted in surprise and uncertainty. Chapter 3. Information is Surprise As we discussed in the previous chapter, knowledge is the true wellspring of wealth in Gilder's revolutionary economic framework. However, knowledge does not emerge from a vacuum. It flows from something more primal and chaotic information. In Gilder's theory, information is defined by its inherent quality of surprise or unexpectedness. Allow me to illustrate with a simple example. If I told you that 1 plus 1 to 2, I would not actually be providing you with any new information. That basic mathematical fact is already known to you, so hearing it stated brings no surprise or novelty. It fails to be informative. However, if I then made the startling claim that 1 plus 1 is sometimes greater than 2, that would certainly constitute a surprise. Your brain would perk up, seeking an explanation for how such a contradiction of known arithmetic is possible. Only once I proceed to explain certain contexts where this counterintuitive statement can hold true, like the combinatorial effects when two minds collaborate on a new idea, or the network effects whereby a platform's value scales exponentially as its user base doubles, does the original surprising statement become informationally meaningful? 
You see, information in its raw state is disorder, a jumble of cognitive surprises and unexpected inputs. Knowledge, on the other hand, emerges through order and verifiability. It is the process of taking those surprising informational stimuli, picking out the valuable signals from the noise through empirical testing, making sense of them, and integrating them into a cohesive framework that produces reliable, transferable knowledge. To extend the previous example, the surprising claim 1 plus 1 2 provides information, but only once it is analysed, qualified, expanded upon and fit into a broader context does it coalesce into learnable, actionable knowledge. Let's revisit the 1 plus 1 2 thought experiment in a more concrete scenario. Imagine you're a budding entrepreneur pitching your software startup idea to a seasoned venture capitalist. Your pitch deck highlights how your product will combine two existing technologies in a novel way to achieve exponential performance gains. To the VC who has seen countless pitches, your projections may initially seem fanciful, even unbelievable, a violation of her conventional expectations akin to one plus on one, two. Your bold claim introduces an element of surprise of new information. However, as you methodically break down your technical architecture, present proof-of-concept demos, and validate your assumptions, that surprising informational claim transitions into defensible knowledge in the mind of the investor. What was once a surprise becomes an accepted truth that can justify funding your venture. The notion of information as surprise plays out in fascinating ways in the realm of scientific research and innovation. Carver Mead, a pioneering figure in modern physics and electrical engineering, applied this philosophy to how he mentored students at Caltech. In Mead's research group meetings, a ritual they practiced was to start each week by sharing and discussing the unsuccessful experiments and failed attempts from the prior week's work. Why focus on the failures? Because Mead understood that the greatest wellsprings of new information often arise from the unexpected surprises and deviations that occur when experiments go awry. If an experiment simply unfolds according to the predicted model with no anomalies, it may confirm existing knowledge, but provides little new information or grist. However, when reality clashes with expectations and an experiment yields surprising, unaccounted-for results, that introduces a rich vein of informational surprise to be mined. By innovating from these unexpected data points, building off the surprises, Mead students could forge new frontiers of knowledge and breakthrough innovations. Their learning process was fundamentally driven by seeking out and embracing the surprise elements that inevitably emerge from the cauldron of experimental science. This is a perspective that runs counter to the conventional academic approach of merely replicating established experiments to reinforce known theories. Caltech's rebel mentality was to prioritize the anomalies, the misfires, the surprises, for that is where the most valuable information resides to catalyze true leaps in human knowledge. Chapter 4. Growth is Learning With Gilder's core tenets that wealth is knowledge, and knowledge stems from surprising new information inputs, we can transition to his final fundamental principle. Economic growth is essentially a perpetual learning process, both for individuals and at a macro scale. One of the most pervasive manifestations of the growth as learning principle can be seen in the learning curve phenomenon that Boston Consulting Group and other strategy firms have extensively studied and capitalized on. The learning curve dynamic goes like this. When a company first rolls out an innovative new product, Manufacturing costs and pricing are inevitably high in those initial runs as they iron out the production process through trial and error. However, 
As sales volumes ramp up and more units roll off the line, the organization reflexively identifies ways to streamline operations, optimize workflows, and reduce costs through their accelerated learning. Competitors enter the fray, furthering the cycle of rapid learning and process refinements in the quest to undercut rivals on pricing and efficiency. The end result? The product's real costs, labor time required, and market pricing all experience a downward trajectory, often dropping 20 or 30 percent with every doubling of cumulative production volume. Perhaps the most famous example of a learning curve propelling economic growth is Moore's Law in the semiconductor industry. First observed by Intel co-founder Gordon Moore in 1965, this remarkable trend line predicted that the number of transistors on a microchip would double approximately every two years, coupled with a halving of costs for that doubled capability. On the surface, it may seem Moore's law was an inevitable conclusion derived from physical limitations or mathematical models. However, Gordon Moore himself admitted that his law was merely an observation about the computer industry's ability to learn and improve at an incredibly rapid rate, not a physical prediction. Time and again, just as skeptics predicted an end to Moore's law, the industry managed to collectively learn workarounds through innovative production techniques and new chip architectures. It is a shining story of economic growth fueled by an avid learning process across thousands of public and private researchers, engineers, manufacturers, and entrepreneurs. So from microchips to automobiles, smartphones to software services, the learning curve phenomenon clearly demonstrates Gilder's maxim, growth does not stem merely from capital investment or increased labor, but from the iterative process of learning, refining, and developing more efficient methods to create value from a fixed pool of resources and knowledge. Ronald Coase, the famous British economist and Nobel laureate, is best known for his insights on why firms exist in the first place. His theory postulates that companies emerge when the transaction costs of procuring something externally exceed the costs of producing it internally. However, Gilder argues that Coase's transaction cost framework, while valid, fails to fully explain the raison d'etre and growth dynamics of the modern corporation. Yes, companies can economize on transaction costs, but their true purpose is as repositories and vectors for creating, retaining, and disseminating new knowledge. Think about it. When a company hires new employees, it isn't just acquiring warm bodies to fulfill transactional roles. Those individuals come packaged with unique skills, experiences, insights, in essence, proprietary knowledge assets that the firm can now channel toward its objectives. Through collaboration, training, process refinements, and institutional learning over time, the company cultivates an ever-evolving knowledge base that allows it to improve efficiency, roll out new products and services, and gain competitive advantages. Its growth is fundamentally driven by its ability to absorb new information and translate it into productized knowledge better than its rivals. The most successful enduring companies are not just ruthless cost cutters, but superb learning organizations, retaining and cross-pollinating their employees' tribal knowledge while simultaneously sourcing new informational inputs to feed their learning metabolism. Of course, the learning process that propels economic growth does not just reside within companies. It occurs at the market level through the churn of creative destruction, the entry of fresh entrepreneurial upstarts constantly disrupting the old guard of established firms. Entrepreneurs play a crucial role in economic vitality by infusing new information, ideas, and mental models that challenge and ultimately displace the prevailing industry knowledge. They force companies to continuously learn and evolve, lest they become obsolete. 
like genetic variation catalyzing natural selection, the entrepreneurial spirit is essential for ensuring the business ecosystem remains vibrant and open to radical reimagination as new knowledge emerges. However, it's not just a Darwinian free-for-all. Entrepreneurs themselves act as crucial validation nodes and crystallization points for new information to solidify into reliable knowledge that can sustain businesses. The entrepreneurial process acts as a crucial validation filter, determining which pieces of novel information and unconventional thinking from the idea realm actually contain valuable signals amidst the noise to translate into viable new businesses. When an entrepreneur successfully shepherds a surprising insight or innovative concept through the gauntlet of real-world market testing, operational refinement, sustained customer adoption and economic viability, that is the crucible through which raw information transmutes into robust, actionable knowledge. It is knowledge solidified not just through theorizing, but by the pragmatic rigors of execution knowledge that can then be systematized, taught, and deployed across industries to seed further growth and innovation. The entrepreneurs are the alchemists, crystallizing the golden nuggets of insight from the disheveled ore of information. So, in summary, the core driver of economic progress and value creation, according to Gilder's information theory, is a perpetual cycle of learning operating at multiple levels. At the micro level, the learning curves within firms and industries as they iteratively improve efficiency and push technological boundaries. At the macro level, the market's dynamic churn and creative destruction process injecting fresh entrepreneurial information to disrupt the old knowledge equilibrium. And overarching it all, human curiosity and our unquenchable thirst to acquire a new knowledge, surprise information that can unlock the next frontiers of wealth creation. Conclusion Over the past few chapters we have unpacked George Gilder's radical rethinking of economics through the lens of information theory. To briefly revisit the four key pillars, money is fundamentally a measure of the time required to obtain goods and services, not just a nominal pricing metric. Assessed through this temporal lens, we see accelerating economic progress enabling more affordable access to resources, not the scarcity narrative of conventional thinking. True wealth does not reside in material resources, but in the knowledge that allows us to create value and abundance from those physical inputs. All economic activity boils down to the exchange of differentiated knowledge across individuals and entities. The primordial spark for new knowledge is information. Specifically, the cognitive surprise and disequilibrium introduced by unexpected deviations from our current mental models. Sustaining growth requires seeking out and capitalizing on these surprising informational inputs. Economic growth itself, whether at the micro level of companies or entire societies, is a perpetual learning process. It stems from our ability to iteratively absorb new information, crystallize it into robust knowledge, and translate those insights into continual efficiency gains and innovations.